Hi, and welcome to the Boat Princess podcast. My name is Nikki Vo, and I'm your host. I am a boat owner, a marina owner, a director on the Marina Industries Association, and a huge advocate for boating. In this series, I'm sharing the stories from every nook of the boating industry with the intention of encouraging more women to join me and for more women to get behind the helm too. I want to share the experience and opportunities of boating, of the boating industry, and I want you to join me as I bring the conversations and answer all the questions you've had. Boating is not just for the glamorous and rich and famous. It's full of beautiful and interesting people making the most of our natural environment and getting out there, enjoying the waterways. So let's set off the lines, take over the helm and escape to the world of boating. So welcome to another episode of the Boat Princess podcast. I am sitting here with Andy and Pete from Princess Yachts here at Plymouth. We have Andy Lawrence, the Director of Design, and we have Pete Cullum Kenyon, the Principal Creative Designer. Welcome, guys. Hi. Hi, how, how are you doing? doing? Good. Great to have you here. So tell me, being at Princess Yachts, pretty exciting place to be. Um Peter, how did you get into Princess Yachts? What happened? Oh, how long have you got? <laughs> um, it's it's one of these things. I think probably the, the succinct version is um, probably the last 15 to 20 years of my career. I've been working with luxury brands, so Bentley and Aston Martin. And I've also been doing some freelance work as well. And Boats was a logical progression for me, really. It's... Uh, if you think of a car, it's a small space and, and you know, motor yachts, you've got lots of small spaces everywhere. So there's just a huge amount of challenge there. Uh, plus it's coastal and, and I'm a bit addicted to the sea. So it made a lot of sense for me. That's awesome. I did actually look up, look you up, Pete. There is a bit of a story in your career history, which is kind of a no-no in Australia. What? You went directly from Ford to Holden. Do you Ford have any idea what that is in Australia? I mean, the, there's the Ford group and then there's the Holden group oh. and you cross the barrier. Absolutely. I mean, that's wow. crazy. There, there's Australians out there now. <laughs> <laughs> Rules are meant to be broken, aren't they? Let's face it. That was, uh, that was such an amazing uh, time of life. It really was. I, I got introduced at the deep end, really, you know, go and, go and check out the Bathurst and, you know, understanding what utes are and, and bogans and everything. So, uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was quite an interesting uh, baptism of fire, really. Yeah. It really is, isn't it? Yeah. But also the passion as well, incredible passion for those brands, both of them. Yeah. Yeah, that we really, really are one camp or the other yeah. in Australia. And it's so sad Holden is no longer with us. Yeah. Um, but, um, but yeah, it, I, when I saw that on your list, and, and it wasn't even a gap, you know. No, straight no, from Ford in Europe. it was straight from one to the other. To Holden in Australia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did you enjoy your time in Australia? I loved it. Absolutely loved it. It's, you know, to me it's... Uh, I'm living in Cornwall now. It's probably the closest I'll get to Melbourne, yeah. but it's uh, just the most incredible outdoors, um, healthy living, sports-based kind of existence. And everyone seems so ridiculously happy when I got there, you know, going from <laughs> East End of London at the time. Oh, and cool. I'm working yeah. in Essex for Ford yes. to, to Melbourne and just wondering what all these people were doing, smiling. Yeah. Yeah. It's just unusual, but um, there did, you go. Did you work in the Ford in, where's, where is that? in um... Dunton. Dunton, yeah. okay. So just north okay. of London, uh, so between there and Cologne okay. as well. So I'd be in Cologne <gasps> one or two days a week. Wow. Yeah, it's great. Wow. And Andy, you worked for a short while in a car brand as well, didn't you? Yeah, a very, very short period, only, only a year during the placement, placement year of my, um, my university course. So yep. I was uh, based in the Midlands, another, another landlocked place, a little bit different to uh, the sunny southwest. Uh, but yeah, so I worked for Jaguar for, for a year there in the, in the styling department. That's not bad at placement, working for Jaguar. It was nice. No, it was, it was great, really. I'm not quite sure how it led into the marine industry, because I think it's a kind of a happy accident. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, and I think that's. I think people don't really think about coming into the marine industry. It's uh, it's, it's such a niche, such mm. a niche kind of uh, product that I think it's it's quite difficult to um, 
sort of see, see yourself designing a product like that? Because can you see yourself actually you know, owning and using and engaging with a product like that when you, when you grow up? I think, I think it's, it's difficult. That's an interesting um an interesting thought there because obviously you you went into the car space and and that was a thing that you thought yeah I can do that whereas the boat space wasn't really on your radar at all yeah no not at all no I mean I've, I've just loved design growing up and always interested in that and didn't really know what I wanted to design I and mean, maybe like I don't know if you wanted to go into cars or, or boats no, or not just, at all. Just I ac- actively design. avoided cars if I'm honest with you it sort of almost felt like this thing that pursued me and, and found me eventually yeah um but yeah i mean uh, I, I know what you mean you, you think of cars that are so familiar and we use you know i mean most of us have a car and it's uh you know it's something that you interact with every day so it's an incredibly familiar product yeah, exactly. and we both have come from product design backgrounds um you know whereas a boat is an aspirational uh item really isn't it you think i i don't know about you but i unfortunately don't have a few million tucked away spare unfortunately not many of us do i stick to kite surfing (laughs) yeah yeah which is great you know and and that's i guess that's the opportunity of boating there's so many different ways we can all get on the water without those few million dollars in our pocket absolutely um and enjoy the 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 pure joy of being out on the water, which is a wonderful thing. I must say, I loved the event that you did in January because you couldn't go to Dusseldorf this year um, down at, was it St. William's Yard? Is that what it's it called? It is the Royal, the Royal William Yard, Royal which is just across the road from us. And, and we're really just trying to make the most of the, the cancellation of, of Dusseldorf and the fact that we had all, all of those finished boats around us uh, that we were desperate to showcase. Yeah. Um, so we set up, it, it seemed, within a, a period of just a fortnight, we'd managed to... Uh, Acquire the space, clear out the the marina over there, take it over and put our on our own little mini show, um, which was which was great. For uh, we managed to get our dealers and a, and a few customers over to see the boats. There were new boats launched. And we had our X eighty there and our, our V fifty, which were you know fantastic products. Oh, We've all V50. invested the last two years of our lives mm-hmm. into them, so we were so keen to to launch. But I think probably probably the best thing for us was that we were able to get all of the people from the factory. So all, all the guys and girls building these boats, developing these boats, we can actually just walk them you know, half a mile up the road and they got a chance to see a, a finished boat. And you take that for granted, you assume that everyone's been on them, don't you? But that's the thing, it's so, it, it's so, um, it's, it's such a frantic pace. I mean, if you think about it compared to the car world, it doesn't, doesn't compare, but it's still such a frantic pace. You know, boats are, are finished in an instant and mm. then and then they're off mm. and and that's the problem so you know it's one of those things where it's really really hard to get to see any boat that's that's finished really um it's gone within a blink of an eye but to be able to have a selection of them all together and be able to sort of see how the product range also sits with itself in terms of different boats and different sizes of boats it's incredible and you know that's probably one of the advantages that we have as a as a brand is the fact that we've got such a, a broad spectrum of of boats. You know, if you think of what you know, previous conversation we were talking about how accessible boating is. It's everything from you know, sort of forty foot up, really. Yeah, exactly. And it was we we hosted some of the evenings over there when we we opened it up to um, uh, to the workforce, and it was. It was quite emotional, really. You, you were getting yeah. guys coming over there who've been building these boats for 30 years. And this was the first time they've actually been allowed to bring their, their families along. They yeah. could bring their children along and say, yeah. look, you know, this, this, this is what I do. This is what I make. And they, yeah. were, they were just bursting with pride, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's great. So I think we're, but that's certainly got the cogs turning for us and think about how can we do you know, much more of this. Yeah, because that's, that's, that's amazing. And that, must, that was quite heartwarming for what, for me, you saying that because I think boat shows and and those sorts of events uh, really bring these beautiful boats to so many people. And sure, not every one of them can afford to buy one, but if their daughter gets to see that boat at the age of ten and aspirationally yeah. thinks, "I want to own one of those when I grow up," then they will build towards that's a goal there's the that's a goal set for them right yeah, there absolutely. and they'll work towards it for many many years and probably get there if they set that goal absolutely so um i think those sorts of events are really really important and i i really encourage people to take their kids to all the boat shows because it's a fantastic day out but 
oh my goodness, the for the kids, it's really goal aspirational. I think, yeah, it's a great way of getting them on onto that whole feeling of, oh yeah, I like this, yeah, because the being on the boats, feeling the boats is very different to, to just looking at them on a on a brochure or a, an ad or whatever. So I think that's really absolutely. Cool. I mean, it's, it's with boating as we all know, it's it's all about the experience. Yeah, you know, it's not it's not just about owning that sort of tangible product. It's it's about Getting yeah, out it and just just it. gets getting out in the elements and just enjoying that time with your friends mm-hmm. and family. It's yeah, it's, it's downtime for people. It's a it's a little sanctuary. Yeah, and it's an incredible thing. Yeah, and and those those kids that went there and saw what their mum or dad do here, are they you're also grooming them to work for Princess because it's a proud place Absolutely. to work at you, think, you, know? you know where you know every everyone from sort of design and development through to uh, production we're all incredibly proud of what we do and it's great to see you know uh, i'd imagine from a build point of view you can, you can imagine it um, you know uh, someone goes in there and goes i built this cabin and for their children that must be incredible you know wow you know yeah mum or dad has, has has done this yeah that's yeah. incredible and from a design point of view it's great you can see these little details that you've added in and and see how they translate into something that's you know physical and you know whether it's a stitch line on a on a on a vanity table or um whatever you know a nicely crafted piece of timber or something like that you know there's all all this thought that goes into it and when you see it in a tangible product it really does you know underline how special it is to do this and be involved with this you, you yeah. never i mean I, I never grow tired of um of that feeling when you see it mm. for the first time properly dressed as as a customer would uh, would receive it yeah because uh, it's it's an unusual industry isn't it because we don't we don't really prototype and so in, in automotive you you've been yeah. used to building you know 15 evaluation units you you build them there'd be you know, huge mock up before that and models and so on and so forth and we yeah. do mock up don't we so we do it, the... exactly we've got a, we've got quite a mix of techniques here so we um, there's a lot of hand sketching that goes on to start with and then everything goes into CAD and it's 3D models and we and we sort of live in this strange 3D environment um because it saves us time yep. and it means we can work with all the different departments and validate what each other are doing and we're make sure we're not sort of nicking the same bit of space um but then we still use some real t- traditional techniques, like we use uh, over on our South Yard uh, site. We mock up the interiors of the boats, all, all of the living spaces, interior and, and exterior. So we've got a little team of guys over there, and they are just building these one-to-one environments out of out of plywood and filler and bits of foam, and uh, and just so we can get in there. You know, our sales as a design team, it's a great sales tool. Uh, we bring customers over; they they can sit in there and just get the feel for the, for the boat there hopefully going to in, invest in um but it's also interacting with that space as well so from yeah. you know me i suppose from a materials palette it's fun, phenomenal because you've got a, a full-size bulkhead and you can imagine what a material you can even offer up a piece of material to it and go oh that's going to be terrible there we can't use that let's change it and do that um but but also how a person or how a client would interact with that space and whether we need to shorten or lengthen the sofa or um you know move move some items around or change some of the furniture that goes into it so i mean it's, it's a phenomenal tool really yeah, and it doesn't it doesn't matter how how good you think you are in that 3d 3d world and, and you're using so much data that we've you know acquired through 50 years of designing boats yeah you always make changes don't you you, yeah. you always you always improve it yeah uh, and it's a great opportunity to get customer feedback dealer dealer feedback that's really really important to us um you know they're, they're the guys who know they're, they're out there using this stuff in anger every every day um, so to get that sort of feedback loop coming into us is 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 great. It's great, really. Um, well, I, I saw that facility yesterday. Oh, good. I'm glad. I'm and glad I was blown away by that, I have to say. It's fun, um, isn't it? it was absolutely incredible. It's. Um, I mean, the building itself is incredible, oh, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. I mean, you're in the, the what, what was it, 15th century or something that that, that building it's, it's is? Crazy, I can't remember, but. Oh, it's a, it's a beautiful old ropery, guys, That for the, those of you that are listening. It's a beautiful old ropery, so incredibly long, um, very old building. And it's full of these incredible mock-ups that Princess have done of the yachts. And you can literally, as you say, and it's things like when you sit on the sofa, do you get to see the view out of the window or is it just a little bit too high, um, which... And that's really, really important stuff. If you sit in the helm, 
does it feel a little bit too skew whiff to the bow or you, you know and and I think that's incredible that you guys do that. And it's, um, I think you guys are the only ones that do that, right? In uh, boat building. Yeah, I, I, I believe we are. And, and a lot of people are trying to convince us to move into virtual reality because you, know, you don't need to do any of that kind of stuff. You can put your headset on and you can you can see it all, you can feel it all. But we, we're we fighting it, aren't we? We it just can't. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can't replace physically being in a room together and having a conversation and sat on the sofa and, and touching and feeling things and, and you know, does something feel close to your head? You, you can't get that feeling. No, uh, no. In VR. Or is the table just a little bit too close to your knees and all those exactly. sorts of things. It's just, I think it's amazing that you guys do that. So it must be pretty exciting doing what you do. I mean, you, you actually create spaces that people thoroughly enjoy for the potentially for the rest of their lives, potentially for a period of time. Um, what's the thrill that you get out of designing these beautiful vessels? You, you can't see this because obviously we're talking on uh, through a microphone, um, but there's two guys sitting on the opposite end of the table to you that are just smiling. We've got this huge smug smile on our face. Um, yeah, I think it's... Uh, you've, got, you've got to pinch yourself it's a uh, good job, every now and again and just uh, sort of lift your head up out of the, out of the sort of daily daily problems and challenges that you've got to get over and actually just ha- have a look around and we're looking out of the window now and there's a line of boats on the, on the water and you think, you know, wow, we've, we've been involved in the development of you know, everything that we produce here and it's, they're incredible products uh, and an incredible group of people developing and, and producing them and that, that's, that's a huge part of it, the people in this business. You know, really, really do make it. There's so, so many people here have got ten years plus experience, and you know, and some are up in there thirty plus years. Yeah, you know, and it's it's fantastic. Really, once I think once once you're in here, and you just think, yeah, this is really what I want to do. It kind of it gets under your skin, and you just you're just so engaged in it. Love it. So, Andy, on that, let's just delve a little bit back because I know you've been here a while, haven't you? So. Can we delve a little bit back into your career? How did you, what was your education for you to get into this role? Uh, as I said earlier, I'm, I've always been interested in in design sort of through my through my school life. And then I went into product design for a degree, um, which was, which was uh, like, like you, it was just uh, teaching you how to design and the, and the process of it. But it was quite broad and didn't, didn't really focus on any one area in, in particular. And then really it was coming here was a, was a happy accident. I've always lived on the South Coast. I grew up in, in, in Swanage, the sort of middle middle of the southwest of England. So I haven't, haven't come straight too far. Um, and I just applied to anyone and everyone I could after I graduated. And, and, and Princess wrote back and said, well, we haven't, haven't really got a role at the moment. Why don't you come down and, and see us and see what we're about and what, and what we do? Uh, so I did. And yeah, a couple of interviews and nice discussions later kind of joined as a as a junior designer yeah which um, and development was a much smaller operation then and probably only about 30 of us up in uh, uh, up in the office and i've just stuck with it and grown through it through the ranks with as the business has grown and as development has grown we are about 100 strong now yeah in the office and then 100 people on the shop floor making plugs and tools uh, for, the, for the first models and um, so yeah so so now i i kind of Director of Design is the actual title. That's is is quite broad. So I kind of look after uh, the d- design, two D, three D design, the layouts, living spaces, what the boat looks like, um, and then I interact with Olazinski, who are, are our naval architects. Yeah, um, they're based on the Isle of Wight. Yeah, and they've they've been selling boats for what 40, 40 years now. Wow! So there's been okay. a huge, you know, a long long, long relationship. Partnership. Yeah, with those guys, and then quite recently we've included Pinafrina, so I sort of managed that relationship between the Princess Design Studio, Olazinski, uh, and Pinafrina. And Pinafrina, can you just go into that for a moment? Yeah, so they um, they they kind of joined our little trio of um, design design groups uh, about five years ago now, and and they focus um, on the the upfront styling, the exterior uh, of the boats. So they work hand in hand with Olazinski. Yeah. So when we when we first start styling, you know, penning the the exterior lines of the boat, yeah, we'll get those guys to to come up with concepts in a room over there, and then we'll get Olszinski to come up with a load of concepts in their office, and then we and then we sort of show put them all up on the, the wall together, just so we get a really nice broad spectrum of of ideas. Because you, you can't help yourself, can you? If you've done something for 
years and years and years, you know, you will think in a certain way. Yes. So we just wanted to get a, a, a different view on life, really. Interesting. Um, and it's quite interesting how the two just complement each other, you know, and really, I think they've probably both raised their game through working with each other, which yeah. has been great to see. So you must be a very um, kind of um, oh, good negotiator or good because because you're working with three sets of creatives there. Yeah, I think a peacekeeper is, <laughs> is probably what I what I should be if I if I, <laughs> if I needed another role. Because they're you know they're all going to have their very strong feelings and opinions about things. So that's a really um, can, they, can they that do, be challenging they do, sometimes? No, I, I think, uh, yeah. Yeah, it can be challenging. Yeah, we've all we've all got uh, quite strong opinions. Um, I enjoy it. I really yeah. enjoy it. Because um, I mean, they're all they're all really nice groups of people. Again, again, I'm very lucky to, to to manage those sorts of people who who are just passionate about what they what they do, but are happy to listen to you know the other views and each other's views and sort of bounce off each other. That's you know, that's great when you can get some different teams working together like that. That's really that's really rewarding. That's awesome. So it's wonderful to see that Princess have really taken your talent and if they didn't even have a position when you came down to see them. They saw your talent and went, oh, we're going to grab him. And then they have really moved you up the system. So that's really great to see that Princess does that. Yeah, that, that's, to be honest, that, that's been our model for, for a, long, a long time now and it's certainly what I've been doing generally. We will, we will bring people in as a graduate or through an apprenticeship scheme. So we've, we've got a few apprentices who've, who've served their, their three or four year apprenticeship scheme and now they, they sort of step up and into being uh, design engineers. Um, but generally they're coming in from all sorts of university backgrounds. And what, what would you say, Pete, was sort of product design is definitely a key background. I mean, I suppose covering the whole gamut, we've got product design, interior design, possibly interior architecture to a certain extent. Um, automotive design automotive, courses is, yeah. is quite, a, quite a popular course um, and they there's very few courses in in the country who actually run specific you know boat design courses yeah but that's, it's kind of okay you, yep. you, know, you don't need to have have that specific background we can teach that yes we just need people who are, who are passionate have got a good eye um, and want to make a difference yeah and, and I guess in a way you know any any creative team uh, benefits from from lots of different opinions and lots of different sets of eyes very much in the same way that you talk about Olazinski and uh, Pininfarina it's it's a similar kind of approach where you want as much input as possible otherwise you end up effectively designing the same thing constantly yes and you don't want that you need to progress that's the whole idea of 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 the creative process really yeah yeah and there, there are so many different disciplines up there, even, even within just that one development department. Yeah. You've also got its creative team, concept designers, furniture designers, small more designers, people who want to do helms, people who are interested in upholstery. You've got engineers, systems engineers, uh, project managers, structural engineers, naval architects. You've got compliance. It's all, there's you know, so, so much so scope, much isn't there? In, in, uh, in it's the a right little, ones. it's a little ecosystem that floats. Really, isn't it, it is. I mean, yeah. essentially, yeah. you you are designing this amazing space, and you know, it has to run, it has to work first time. Yeah, uh, it has to be able to support people. You have to be able to sleep, and and move. And, yeah, you know, it's phenomenally challenging, really, when you think about it. There is and so much in it. Yeah. For, so for anyone that's got a, any sort of creative mind, I think it's it's definitely something worth worth exploring yeah for sure yeah and i love andy what andy said at the beginning about i just applied to everybody that was a i I think that's a lesson for everybody out there um when you come out of college or uni or wherever or school you just apply everywhere and and see what happens Mm. i think i think don't um don't sort of say oh no i couldn't do that because i don't have a boating background or whatever just go for it and see what happens so pete your career was a bit more um, car orientated at the start, and yeah. then you came to here. Can you tell us a little about a bit about your journey? So yeah, much the same as uh, as Andy. I studied I studied product design. I studied at uh, Central Saint Martins in London, and uh, popped out of that just as we were going into a recession, and diversified basically. And I would say my entire career has been a bit of a happy accident. It wasn't planned. I, I actively avoided going into the car industry. I remember 
going into a, a, an interview at Lotus thinking, I don't really want to work at Lotus, which now is like, well, I actually wouldn't mind a Lotus. Thank you very much. But there you go. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I uh, you know, I've worked for, as you, as you earlier pointed out, Ford Holden in Australia, most amazing experience. I've worked in Shanghai for a short while. Um, yeah, a few, a few global assignments as well as back in the UK. Um, and I suppose just prior to Princess Yachts, it would have been uh, Bentley, where I was a um, head of um, department for sort of basically materials, colours, craftsmanship, design. Yeah. And uh, and then on to Aston Martin, uh, where I pretty much specialised in doing very short projects that no one else wanted to touch and and concept cars, wow. which was amazing. Yeah, um, and then a little bit of freelance boating uh, work, and then and then up to Princess Yachts. <gasps> so yeah, a bit of a, an eclectic mix of of different things. And as I say, I, I feel a bit of a, a fraud in some ways because it wasn't really particularly planned; it just happened organically. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, if, Andy, if you've had the same thing, but every so often you get a young designer approach you, probably through LinkedIn, basically saying, "Oh, I'd really, really like to work for for Bentley. How do I? How do I? Uh, how did you get to Bentley?" And I'm thinking, well, it wasn't terribly planned; it just happened. And I think that whole idea of don't put limits on your career, don't don't set yourself a limit and say, "Well, I can only do this because that's what I've trained." Yes. Um, for us, I think we we actively go seeking people to join teams who've got a very eclectic. Um, background who have a different opinion have different set of eyes to us um, and that and that, I think that only benefits the end product yeah is that exactly I mean for me it's all about attitude mm. if people have got the right attitude and, and outlook on on life and what they want to achieve and what and if they can communicate well with other people then you're halfway there yeah yeah love it love it so I'm a massive princess fan always have been love your internal design and then the way your boats look and feel how do you guys i mean that's quite a to keep that sort of princess feel to everything um how do you how do you do that yeah well it's, it's, that's a, big it's, question. A, it's a bit it's a big question <laughs> um and it, and it certainly doesn't just happen yeah um there's, there's a lot of effort that goes in planning a, isn't it? a lot of planning and yeah. uh, enhancing that kind of goes into into that end result um i mean to start the process off certainly if we're talking about an, an interior scheme you know pete your your team basically try to set that vision for for the feel of the boat you know what how do we want a particular class to, to feel i mean we're you know i suppose the the newer generation of boats we've we've um we're a couple of years on from um, setting that scene. So if you take, I don't know, F class, X class, Y class, B and S class, we, we we set out a stall basically to start with where we start planning, we start thinking about the characters of these classes and, and what that means in very basic terms. So it could be in terms of how a sofa might appear or, um, you know, particular materials palettes or, or the contrast levels that go on in the interior, which um, create this sort of uh, slightly intangible kind of personality, I guess, for an interior of a boat. And it helps so that when you, when you, the idea being that you walk onto a Y class boat and instantly know it's a Y class. Hmm. And you don't need to have Y stuffed everywhere to tell you it's a Y class. You just know because it's got fine materials, amazing craftsmanship, incredible detailing. You know, it sort of has that architectural feel to the interior of it as well. And uh, so there's, yeah, as, as Andy was saying, there's a huge amount of planning that goes into this. We think about it to start with, and then it basically trickles down into the boats. And as we design the boats, that gets, I guess, um, sort of iterated. And yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, Pete's coming at it from quite a sort of, you know, emotional standpoint there. How, how does something feel? Mm. Uh, and then at the other end of the spectrum, we, we control we control that feel and look through, you know, a lot of standards. So, so everything is recorded, you know, how exactly where a catch sits and what the landing thickness is, what gutter section you're going to use for a certain type of hatch, how wide should the side deck be, what headroom do you allow in every one of the spaces, you know, all of this stuff is, is is written down and recorded every time, yeah, that went well, you know, it gets added to the little design bible that we that we all sort of uh, use to, to create these boats. And then, yeah, we just kind of blend the two, mm. blend the two in the middle. Um, but it's, yeah, it's 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 hard work, sort of. Mm. Uh, even though you've got all of that data around you, think about 
okay, what now? What do we do for the next one, the next one, the next one? So they keep feeling fresh yeah. and they keep feeling like they're moving forwards. Is I mean, that's, it's really exciting. We love it, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think you do an amazing job of that. Yeah, um, thank you. For those listening, can we just um, go through those class- your different classes of yachts that you make? Because some of our listeners may not know that Princess has that many classes and how they differ. So can you just give a little summary of each class? Sure. Sure. Um, so we we have so the class that we're trying to explain so sort of from the smaller boats up the so the V class is really our open sports boat. Um, so it will be lower accommodation, generally an open a bigger open cockpit, no flybridge on it, so a big sliding roof, uh, and the, some of the smaller ones are completely open with with rag tops. And then as you as you move up through the through the size, a patio door will appear. Uh, but we try and do clever things to get rid of the door so you can open it up. So even though it's got a door and you can close the thing up, it feels really open. So uh, we we class them as day boats, but they're you know they're quite quite big day day boats. And they aimed at a certain client, or um, would you say it's someone that's more likely to to use it for the day? They'll come and enjoy their boat, and then um, you know they can stay over if they like. Yeah. And the accommodation is definitely there, but it's probably I would I would I think I think imagine you're right. it's, it's more it's, a, it's more time in the water yeah. than, than on the water. So a bit younger, more yeah. time poor, a, a that little, sort of yeah, a little bit, yeah. a little bit, and also young at heart, yeah. possibly as yeah. well. Okay, yeah. Yeah. yeah, gotcha. So they'll be styled in a slightly sportier, edgier way. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also, some people would find having a having a flybridge and that, that a taller, bigger boat a little bit daunting. Mm. So, so it, I think it just feels a bit more manageable. Yep. So, great start point, in other words. Yeah, great, great start point. Um, and then, if I sort of jump to the, the, you know, the real core, the bread and butter of, of Princess would be the Flybridge boats. You know, they're they're very they're super practical boats, aren't mm-hmm. they? You can sleep on them, great accommodation, you know, good headroom, and you've got the the bonus of having that that Flybridge, so a sort of third third deck. So really, you're maximising your space for for you know for every length of you know foot of boat you've got. Yep. Um, so F Flybridge F class folks, yep. keeping it nice and so simple. So F class, yep. that's F class. Yep. Um, and then that has a certain spec level to it. And then as you progress up through the sizes, similar similar theory with a Flybridge, but you then break into Y class, um, and that happens at seventy feet. So Y seventy two is the first first Y class. You take a quite a significant step up in specification yep. generally when we start to break the 70 foot mark plus you, the crew becomes really important yeah so crew cabins become standard um much more thought goes into the the crew operation of the boat rather than just a, an owner operator um but but we find a lot of our a lot of our owners operate our boats you know right up to sort of 80s we, we've had one operating 95 pretty much on on their own with min, minimal crew Love it. But but generally, generally yeah. wide class is a little bit so more focused on the crew. If we bring it back to cars for a moment, just to make it easier for our listeners, that Y class is sort of the S class of Mercedes. That sort of is that I would say Y class is um a little more like a Bentley. Yes. And uh, if you think of a you know something like a I don't know, a Continental or a Flying Spur, it's that kind of a product. And yeah. then we have an X class, which is an extension of that, which is possibly more like the Ben Tiger. Okay. Uh, so exactly. So this is X class is is fairly new to us with, yes. with the ninety five and now now the eighty, and this really is about absolutely maximizing every every bit of space you can you can get. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. We, so we, we it only has one helm. So we remove the lower helm. Okay. Push that up onto the top deck, and that basically unlocks your main deck accommodation space. So you don't have that block in the middle where you. It's accommodation after it, and then you've got to sneak around, and you have accommodation forward. You've got an entire top deck that you can you can do what you like with. So X class has effectively an enclosed flybridge. I think you call it a skybridge, don't you? Yeah. So, we'll, yeah. so we'll call it a, a sky a skybridge with a sky lounge on there. So it's an air yeah. conditioned space. Yes. On that top deck, and it's your main bridge. Did you hear that, Australians? That's an enclosed flybridge from Princess. Happy days, because in Australia. We love an enclosed flybridge <laughs> because we um, we have really hot weather. So um, we love our air-conditioned space when we're boating and, and the distances that we do offshore, we really need an enclosed flybridge because we can't spend that amount of time exposed to the weather 
um, doing great, you know, 22, 30 knots um, for hours on end sort of thing. So I'm really excited about that for the Australian market because that that is a big change from Princess for yeah, us. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. The, this, this sort of additional class was definitely put in there to target markets like your own. Yeah. Uh, and sort of um, Southeast Asia, is, it, exactly. It's the people who don't want to be outside getting blasted by the sun yeah. uh, all, all the time. And then finally, we've got the S class, which really blends sort of the best of V and the best of F um, together. So it's got a, it does have a flybridge, yep. but it's a little bit reduced in in size. Um, the styling is sportier; it's more aggressive. It's a little it's, bit edgier. It's, it's in yeah. line with the V, isn't it? So we yeah. we would pair V and S together. Yes, it's been sports boats. Um, you've got a garage at the back, the same as the V class boats do. So you can put your tender sort of neatly. Neatly nice. away, shut it all up. It's all, it's all very, very, very nice, isn't it? Yeah, um, I love a tender garage. I've got to say, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit nice. <laughs> and as you get, obviously, as you get bigger, so it's sort of up to sort of seventy feet, more refinery, more detailing, more craftsmanship, still with a sort of technical edge. Yeah. Um, but again, it starts to feel a little bit more like, um, uh, I don't know, uh, Mulliner type sort of uh, Bentley and that that kind of ilk or a super sport that sort of a thing yes yeah I, I kind of associate your s class with sleek and stylish yeah you know the s is that's what they are for it's, me it's because a it's, very, it's, cool. a, it's a gt it's very, isn't it? it's, yeah it, it's got the sporty styling but it's very comfortable yeah beautiful lines guys amazing lines they have they're just incredible what i mean all your boats do but the s class especially it's really oh yeah it's great so you guys have homes and you have be- you're designing beautiful boats every day. Um, I always think it's such a shame that we don't design our houses as beautifully as we do our boats because you guys find space where there is nobody knew there was a space there and suddenly there's this, um, you know, like your pop-up pantries and all those in this tiny corner that you can't get to, all those sorts of things that you guys do. Do you find your design ideas coming to the fore at home do you are you getting cabinet makers in to build things that nobody else has in at home yeah yeah it, it's it's happened to be I, I had some some joins in a couple of years ago just it was only a silly little understair job that's you know got all the white goods and storage and wine racks and fridge and stuff in them and kind of handed the hand to the guys who came to make it this sort of full drawing and they were just so confused don't know. someone <laughs> someone had given them a drawing literally with everything on there that they wanted and normally people just sort of wave their arms and say can you do me a cupboard and so um but yeah there's a cost associated with it and that, that ge- that's generally that's generally the kind of um the bit that holds you back at home uh, absolutely on the same page i have to say i'm i'm, I'm permanently broke and um uh, and spending far too much on, on my house and and you uh, i think the, the trick to being a good designer is to know when to stop and um, I think when it's your own space, that's exceptionally hard. Yes. There's just there's just not a point. I mean, I've not quite the same, but I've got a I've got an attic bathroom that went into a space that none of my friends, no builder, believed would actually work, and it yeah. does. Brilliant. It is tight, um, and I'm going to blame um, my career at Princess Yachts for that. <laughs> Definitely, <laughs> you know, you find space where there is none. <laughs> Well, what you thought there was none. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, th- I think that's something amazing you guys do, the, the amount of space you find for storage. And oh, it's, it's spectacular that you guys manage to fit into a boat, I have to say. So where would you like to see Princess go in the future? Where's your vision? It's that's such a big question, isn't it? And, yeah. and, and so many different avenues we could we could go down. I mean, from a... From a materials point of view, where we're we're already pushing that way, aren't we? So exactly talking about you know the uh, you know one of the the biggest questions I think for for the the boat well the car and boat every industry really is sustainability. Yes. So we are actively researching, pushing very hard in that direction to see what we can do. Yeah. And um, we are in the process of um, trialing materials currently. And I um, can't say too much more, but watch this space. Oh, I love that. 
Yeah, yeah cuz that is really important, isn't isn't it? If you if you think of standard selection of materials, standard carpets, wall coverings, all sorts of things, these have been used for years and years and years and they're very tried and very t- tested. Yes. We um, it feels like we're jumping off a cliff at the moment. So we're we're going either going back hundreds of years and looking at different ways of creating sofa cushions um, using natural materials yes uh, or we or we're looking at other things which um, just aren't as durable as as synthetic equivalents and um, it, it there's a lot of work that that's required to make sure it's something that's going to last the test of time it's not you know we're, we're not looking for a a new story here we're looking for something that's that's valid and is it, we're doing it not because it's sustainable well we are doing it because it's sustainable but we're yeah. doing it because it's actually the right thing to do yeah and also you've got to keep it on brand it's really it, it's, exactly it's yeah. so important that the that the, the feel of everything mm. every sustainable alternative feels luxurious yeah and if it doesn't then it doesn't belong you know yeah in this product yes on, or on the on this product uh, so we've been very, very careful, aren't we, with our with our selections at the moment, um, and we're coming along the journey you know, with our supply base. Yep. You know, every, we we can say we want we want all of this this product, uh, but the suppliers aren't there themselves yet. So mm. that's that's what Pete's sort of talking about there. We're, yeah. we're out there talking to dozens and dozens and dozens of suppliers to see what they're actually working on, and I think our our role in this is to create demand. Yeah, you know, we we need to give them the the encouragement to develop materials and products themselves. Yeah, and we've certainly noticed a change in attitude as well. I'd say in the last, um, I mean, this has been going on for almost three years. And when we first started talking to people about this, they're like, "Oh, yeah, well, you know, no, we we don't see any demand for this." As as Andy was saying, we're not interested. Mm. And and now it's very much like, well, actually, we've got this product, and it's got uh, I don't know, sixty percent recycled material within it, which is a start. Or we've got this other product, which is a hundred percent organic, or, or whatever it happens to be. Mm. So it's interesting. I think I think there's a there's a, a it's like forgive the analogy but it's a bit like getting a super tanker to change direction it takes a long time to start with it and all of a sudden it swings around and we're starting to feel the momentum build in every industry really and uh, and we want to be we want to be cutting edge we you know as a brand we are cutting edge mm. so it's important to us that we succeed mm, absolutely and it is it's just trying to get the right pace you know we need to the legislation isn't driving us this way yeah. So we're we're doing it because we know it's the right thing to do, and it's something something that we we want to do. We yeah. just want to be very careful about it. Like I say, the selection, make sure everything's tested, uh, and it's to the same standard and quality uh, as the the equipment and the material that we're fitting today. Yeah. Um, and we're trying to we're trying to come at it from from all angles. So you know, Pete's talking about the materials that that you touch. We're obviously working with our naval architects on trying to make the boats more efficient. Uh, I think the 95 took quite a big step. I think we 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 quote around about 18% efficiency or less drag yes. uh, than you would have over an equivalent um, size boat from our previous generation of hulls. Yeah. So, so with each hull form that we're developing, we're just trying to find you know, a little bit more efficiency. Yeah. Um, and then we're working with engine suppliers and do we, do we go down a hybrid route? Uh, what, what kind of electrification can we put on, on the boats? It, it doesn't really work very well for big boats. You can't just turn them to be, you know, uh, electrically powered like a car. It just doesn't work in the same same kind of way. So we've got we've got to find an alternative, and we're 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 talking to all of our suppliers at the moment. So we just need to come at it from all of those different different angles, uh, and then also operationally how we actually produce the boats, the energy uh, that we produce. We're we're investing in in solar. Uh, we've got biomass boilers just gone in over over at South Yard. So there's all sorts of things happening across the across the business at the, at the moment. That's amazing. Biomass boilers. Tell me about that. I've got one at home. It's great. Ah. Yeah, it, run, it runs. Up, the the one that I have runs on wood pellets. Yeah. And uh, so in the, I don't know if they use this in Australia, but they in the UK the wood pellets are typically used on a stable floor over yeah. winter. Throw them on the floor, sprinkle them in water. But I'm I'm sticking them into a hopper, and yeah. and it's a little bit like um, uh, it's a, it's a bit like a wood burning stove, but it's an automated wood burning stove. So it feeds the uh, the stove with just the right amount of pellets. Yeah depending on the demand, either from your heating or your hot water. 
And I mean, the advantage for me is I live on a, I live coastally in the UK. So it's damp and it's cold over winter. And I live in a really old house that's very drafty. And my house has never been so warm or dry. So that's great. Um, but it but it also works on uh, it works from waste product from uh, renewable forest sources. So it's um, particular pellets that I get are from the building industry. And uh, what Andy's talking about in terms of princess yachts is that we're we're basically using waste timber from kit parts, exactly, and we're burning yeah. that and creating energy. So Amazing. it's a, it's part of this sort of circular thing where we're we're being a responsible manufacturer, and we're finding sustainable ways to to heat our premises. Which is great. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful. And so that sounds like big job ahead, guys. You've got lots to do. <laughs> indeed. Yeah, in, indeed. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's another little challenge, but it's exciting. Yeah, yeah. And and I guess that's what makes your job so interesting. It's continually changing and and evolving. And, and yet at the same time, you're creating this timeless beauty because you're very good at that. So you, you create a really timeless boat that's really important to us yeah. having something which isn't seen as just today's fashion item uh it is so important because we we know that the resale value is is high on the princess we have a, a lot of repeat customers um and the second hand market is is strong so that's that's mm. certainly something we're going to continue with yeah it's absolutely fantastic so it's been awesome talking to you guys today. I really appreciate your time today. I know you are very busy guys, and I really appreciate you being in with us today to talk no, it's to us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so much. And um, I really admire what you do. You are very clever guys. Um, you're doing an amazing job. Don't stop doing that because we all love your yachts. They're absolutely amazing. Um, There's a, a great team up there doing it, doing a lot of hard work. So it's, uh, it's credit to them, really. Yeah. I mean, I saw your um, your the detail of your drawings um, out there on the factory floor. I mean, I'm an architect's daughter, so I've seen drawings. But that, I mean, you guys go into, like you said, with with the builder, the cabin maker turning up at your house and going, oh, hang on, this is a bit more than we used to. That is what you guys are out there doing. It's uh, it's just incredible. Tell me, just to finish off, what what do you love most about doing what you do? I, I like I like seeing other people's reactions to the boat. Um, I, you know, Andy Andy mentioned we had this event at Royal William Yard just recently. Um, we I think there's 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 phases that people go through when they see a new boat, and I think there's a lot of nervousness as it's coming together because it doesn't look like a boat really until it's finished. All of a sudden, it all comes together, bam, and it's done. Um, and seeing, for instance, our sales director Will his beaming face as he'd seen the boat for the first time. There's a, an element of, thank goodness, yeah. we, we we pulled it off and it looks brilliant. Um, but there's also this immense pride because you see this finished article and it just looks incredible. And, and, and in a really short space of time yeah. as well. You know, this is pretty much two years from from first discussion to, yeah. to actually handing a product over to a customer. You know, that, that's great. So you, yeah. the, the energy is high. All the way through the development and build and, and handover of uh, of that product, and, yeah. and just knowing that you're creating something that someone else is going to enjoy, absolutely, is, is great. Yeah. Do you get to see that handover? Do you see a lot of handovers directly to clients, or generally, generally not from from the yard? We we yeah. hand over to a distributor, yeah, and then the distributor will will spend you know more more time with with the client handing over. Yeah. Because um yeah as a uh, as a person that spent a lot of time at boat shows, I see a lot of happy people on princesses, just so you know. Yeah. It's it's just, like they, they, um, it, it, there is a bit of, um, what would you say is the, is the kind of fundamental difference in the design of your brand? I know this is another really big question, guys, but um, the fundamental difference in your brand as opposed to your competitors out there. What's the one thing you could think of that is say I, that's I, princess? In terms of the interiors and the bits that I interface with most, I would say, I mean, there's, a, there's a, we design to um, with with the thought of process in mind. So I think if you're if you're a designer, you have to know how something goes together. We spend a lot of time thinking about how something goes together, and we work with that as opposed to fighting it. So I think that's that's definitely one element. 
The second element is when you look at our interiors, they're organic, they flow. Mm. A lot of our competitors are quite square. Now, I think most people can understand it's very easy to make a square box. It's a lot harder to make something curved. Yes. Um, but there's a lot of advantages with that, not only because it feels more sculptural and more designed and more considered, but it's also stronger, which means you can make it lighter. And, and, weight and, equals and it's speed more, and, and it's more, it's more comfortable. Absolutely. So it's easier to move ar around the, the boat and it's boat. Yeah. yeah. Let's remember this thing isn't, isn't stationary, you know, it's, you it's, don't it's want sharp around. corners. No, you don't. Cause they really hurt when you back yeah, into them when yeah, you're absolutely. in motion. Yeah, exactly. And they, I, I think they just generally feel a little bit more considered and refined. And I, and I hope you can sort of see that the, the influence of the customers have over the final product, just for the, the advice that they give us that loop is constantly working. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm really glad you said Pete curves effectively because mm. print i always see so many more curves on princess Absolutely. than any other brand and I, I think you do it beautifully yeah so um that curves that quality of finish you really get your quality of finish and oh and the other thing is your cupboards always line up it's <laughs> <laughs> very important it is, it is, it is. it's a lot of a lot of design reviews as well making sure that lines fire through from one item into another as well there's a you know as andy was saying there's a huge amount that's really considered a lot more than you probably pick up yeah subliminal details with, that make us smile and you know a client might walk onto a boat and go oh this is a really nice space but they wouldn't necessarily pick up why yes and i think that's that's what we're talking about really isn't it I think, yeah i think that's 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 a skill in what we do really it's it's, it's not obvious why it feels yeah. right it just does feel right yeah. yeah love it love it thank you so much guys brilliant to talk to you um i hope you have an amazing career at princess both of you I have to keep doing what you're doing we love 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 what you're doing so um and thanks for your time it's been amazing no problem at all yeah thank great you. great to talk to you thanks a lot so uh, that was another brilliant episode of the uh, podcast with some amazing guests. It's been amazing um, visit, visiting Plymouth and being here at Princess. They've been they're such an open book, this company. They are so willing to share their knowledge and uh, they're also nice. <laughs> so <laughs> thanks, guys, for listening and we'll see you on the water soon. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Boat Princess podcast. I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you'd like to know more about what I do and where I am, then you can follow me on Instagram at the Boat Princess. You can also sign up to my newsletter on my website, which is theboatprincess.com. Take care of yourselves, everyone, and hopefully we'll see you on the water soon. Thank you.